Hello and welcome to Moderate Fantasy Violence, a podcast about pop culture and the world around it. I'm Alistair. And I'm Nick. And in today's episode, we will be investigating a creepy abandoned space station in Alien Romulus, and then diving into our obsession with a 90s TV show in cult horror drama, I Saw the TV Glow. But before all of that, Nick, what have you been up to since we last spoke? Well, I think this just about came since we last spoke. I finished watching Star Wars The Acolyte. As I may have mentioned in the previous episode, I got a bit behind on my recent current relevant TV over the course of the month of July or so, because I just was away a lot. So I'm just catching up, and I finally finished Acolyte, and then, a few days ago, they cancelled it. So... I thought we should probably get it into the podcast now while it's still clinging on to the last few remnants of its relevancy. So yeah, this is of course the Star Wars show on Disney+, Plus, the newest one as of now, about two twin sisters, one of whom, well both of whom were taken from their, their witch clan at a young age by a group of Jedi, and then one of whom went on to become strong in the Force and undergo Jedi training, the other of whom fell in with a Sith, and the group of Jedi who took them from their family are now being picked off, and we must get into the mystery of exactly what happened, and whether the Jedi are covering up corruption, and which one of the siblings is truly good, and that sort of thing. And yep, I've seen all eight episodes of this. It's... I think I'm just going to get the words interesting failure out there early doors, to be honest. It's got a lot of interesting things it's trying to do. I very much appreciate the fact that this is a Star Wars show which isn't just continuing to flog the corpse of the Skywalker saga. I do think it's trying to ask some interesting questions about, you know, corrupt law enforcement and so on, and some character journeys which have some interesting moral complexity. I just found it, I don't know, I just found the way it did it slightly clunky and unengaging at times. I didn't feel the characters fully got me except for a couple of standout exceptions. Uh, Manny Yakinto from Good Place turns up playing the main Sith villain. He's definitely an exception. He's very good in this. But yeah, a lot of it is just feels slightly clunky and distant and some of the ways they string out the mysteries start to feel a bit forced. There's a couple of flashback episodes but the main difference between them seems to be that the first one they just don't tell you a bunch of stuff. So yeah, it's an interesting show, perhaps slightly roughly executed. I'm sort of glad they did it but I could also see why it perhaps didn't grip people and isn't getting a second season. Yeah, I felt like they didn't have quite enough plot for the number of episodes they had. I know this is a criticism we make of lots of shows um, but I feel it is very much the case here that this could have been shorter maybe even better as like a film yeah it does definitely suffer from the chopped up movie syndrome of a lot of modern streaming shows Uh, i mean uh, to be honest a lot of the star wars shows and maybe even more broadly disney plus shows from marvel and stuff have suffered from a similar problem i don't know if they've quite cracked making tv yet no but um i you know i enjoyed this to the degree that i found it entertaining there were some things i quite liked about it but at some points I found that the plot could have been more engaging and some of the characters a little thin um I guess I sort of yeah liked it a bit didn't like it a bit um I thought some of the lightsaber fights were amazing though they had some really great choreography some great fight sequences possibly even better than the duel of the fates which is could be the best lightsaber fight from the films that's the the one at the end of Phantom Menace which although no, a great film does have that amazing fight with Darth Maul at the end. There's a big fight, I think it's in kind of the middle, one of the middle episodes with the um, the new Sith villain in like, that takes place in a forest. I just thought, yeah, there was a absolutely spe- spectacular lightsaber fight. And yeah, it's not often you see something new with lightsaber fights in Star Wars media because there's been so many of them. Um, but this one does actually seem they were doing something interesting and original with that. So I did really like the choreography and they really put a lot of effort into making the action exciting and thrilling. Yeah, yeah, no, the action was definitely one of the highlights of this show. There was, There's at least one decent Star Wars action sequence in most of the episodes. Yeah, they're, they're all pretty good. As you say, the forest action sequence around, I think, episodes four and five, those are probably some of the best parts of the whole series because they, those especially were very action-orientated. I don't have a lightsaber fights league table because I'm not quite as much of a Star Wars person. But yeah, these are definitely some of the better action stuff I've seen in the recent Star Wars stuff. Yeah, they did various things to broaden out the universe though quite like there was the Force Witches who were in this. Although they're a crucial part of the plot, I felt they could have been yeah developed better. Quite like how it's set in the High Republic era. I think it's something like three hundred or four hundred years before the events of um the Phantom Menace or something like that. So it really is a totally different time frame. And yeah, totally different setting, like temporally within the Star Wars universe. So that was different. Yeah, I think this is the 
oldest piece of live action media in terms of the well the furthest historically in the chronology those are some interesting things they were doing differently yeah i did find with this show my enthusiasm for it kind of started off kind of strong i was kind of interested in the newness of it and the the fact that it yeah was doing different things in a different setting and then my interest kind of waned as it went along with a bit of a spike around that big action sequence in the middle as i realized the plot was a bit of a, a jumbled mess yeah which is a shame they had a good cast as well. Daphne Keane, who we were talking about last week in uh, Deadpool and Wolverine. She's good in this as well. Someone turning up. Carrie Ann Moss. Uh, you've, yeah, you've already mentioned your man from The Good Place, Jason, turning up in a playing a very different character. Almost, yeah, unrecognisable just because of the performance. Yeah, J.D. Turner-Smith. Yeah, there's, uh, there's, yeah, there's a lot of good people in this. It's a shame, I guess, it just didn't come together. Yeah, no, it's annoying. It's one of these things you do go in wanting to like. I mean, obviously, there have been some people on the internet who very much went into it with the opposite expectation and then proceed to, as far as I can tell, mostly whined about the fact that it's got some law contradictions in it or something, which I really could not care less about. I, I do think the show doesn't quite work, but, you know, let's try and go deeper than that. Yeah, I feel that if you go into something deciding in advance that you're going to hate it, then you're going to hate it. Or set the bar so incredibly high that only something that's like truly amazing will pass it. I mean, this is possibly why a lot of Star Wars fans have only liked Andor because, um, I guess, and The Mandalorian as well. But yeah, we're only really seeing the praise of Andor because Andor is really, really good. It's definitely like the best thing they met. But if you're going to set the bar that high, you will be disappointed. And I feel if you... If you've got an axe to grind, be it, you know, Disney or, I don't know, the various culture warriors who like to headbang on this, then, yeah, you can find reason to bang, you know, to headbang over over this. But I don't know. I don't feel that that people are necessarily going into this being objective. And certainly some of the vitriol directed to the show is disproportionate to a show that is not terrible. It's just, you know, kind of a bit rambling and a bit underdeveloped, which is not the same as being awful. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, the Star Wars shows that they've made outside of the Mandalorian and Andor, have largely felt a bit thinly sketched, to be honest. A bit like an idea for a show that they should maybe have done another couple of drafts of before filming it. And this is kind of another one of those. Yeah, I don't know if it's because they've got like a content pipeline and they have to rush stuff out through or or whatever. Which is a shame that it came out this way. I mean, like, there's uh, one of the creative team behind it is the director of After Yang that we both really liked uh, and I put in my top films of the year. I'm not going to take a shot at pronouncing the name because I'm really worried I'm going to get it wrong. But yeah, the director after Yang is, is a great piece of creative talent to have on board. So you, you think it would be, uh, it would work out better. But yeah, I guess, I don't know, studio constraints, time constraints, for whatever reason means it. Again, as we've, we've said about some of the Marvel shows, it feels like it came out of the oven before it was quite done. Like, you, you know, or as you just said, maybe the script needed some more drafts. Yeah, I think so. I think it's, it does just come across as a bit half-baked, which is a shame, but there we go. I believe there's another one along in literally the next couple of months, so I will find ways to get over my disappointment, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, and more Andor this year, I believe. But yeah, I know, this was entertaining, and I did enjoy you sitting down each week and watching another episode, I guess because I'm a big Star Wars fan, and I've always been a fan since like my childhood. Um, but yeah, like you say, the fact there's like a cool action scene in every episode meant it was like, you know, enough to keep you excited and coming back for more. I guess the fan in me was like perfectly satisfied with my entertainment value. The critic obviously can see the flaws of this. Yeah, yeah, I think there's some decent Star Warsiness here if you just want a good pipeline of the Star Wars. Anyway, Alistair, what have you been getting a good pipeline of? Well, it's another streaming show. There's a lot of them about right now. You are trying desperately to uh, stay on top of all of them. But I've been watching the second series of Cleo, which is a German spy drama uh, on Netflix. It's set during the very early 90s about uh, Cleo, who's a former DDR East German assassin who has been betrayed by her uh, superiors, thrown in prison, then is released after the fall of communism. And she goes on a revenge streak. And yeah, this second series picks up when... She's got some revenge and killed quite a lot of people, but she wants the rest of her slice of revenge. And also in this second series, they're building out the plot a bit more, going into her past, her family. She's got various suppressed memories. uh, And also there's a mysterious suitcase that was at the end of the first season that is now being investigated fully. So yeah, they're continuing the spy adventure and it's still really good fun. It's still got this bizarre very lurid, madcap, slightly humorous approach to it in that although it's like, you know, it's not a super serious spy drama, you know, you're supposed to feel for Cleo and certainly the first episode when she gets uh, thrown in prison is actually quite grim. 
Um, but there was also some very funny bits and a lot of like crazy over the top car chases and action scenes that are sort of tongue firmly in cheek. So it's got a good tone that it's aiming for and which carries on to the second season. So I can strongly recommend this show. Uh, yeah, I was actually in Berlin during one of my trips away in July that I was doing instead of watching Star Wars shows. And yeah, there were quite a lot of posters for the release of this show. They seem to, well, they love it in Germany and or they really want people to love it in Germany. Yeah, I don't know how popular it is there, but it does seem to be something that like the Netflix have put a lot of effort behind, I think, like marketing in Germany and things like that. I've seen lots of content on uh, YouTube and on Instagram of like giant billboards. So, and this seems to be like a high profile show. So the main actress, uh, Jella Hasser, I think that's the correct German pronunciation. I think she's, yeah, a relatively well-known German actor. Um, She was in a great sort of LGBT teen drama called uh, Cocoon. Um, That was very well received, especially in by the art house film crowd. And it's a very good uh, LGBT teen coming of age story. Um, I think they've got some other well-known people in it. Uh, Jung Hang was, is also in a lot of Hollywood things. She was in The Menu, which is very good, playing an English language role in that. So, yeah, I think there's quite a high-profile cast, and they've got sort of, yeah, money behind it for promoting. So I assume this is, like, quite a big deal in the uh, German-speaking world. But, yeah, I mean, I have heard this is good fun. I've never got around to watching it. So, yeah, this is fun spy stuff. Yeah, yeah, and it's got a a real sense of humour to it as well, which is, yeah, as well as the kind of, like, conspiracies and sort of dark revenge side. She sort of teams up with a policeman from West Germany who's a bit of, like, a lovable loser. Um, He's just, like, a regular cop who has unfortunately uncovered Cleo's assassination ring and thinks this is his ticket to being a big-time cop, but obviously he's just a bit of an idiot and a loser, so he's quite a good comedy foil. She also, when she gets out of prison, discovers that a this young man from West Berlin has just moved into her flat. So he's a burned out braver from the West Berlin club scene. And he wants to kind of yeah, bring warehouse clubbing to to East Berlin now that the um, the walls come down. But he's also taking so many drugs. He also believes that this is a mission from the planet Cirrus or the star Cirrus that he's on. Um, and he can only go back to his home planet. So he's also quite a funny, you know, silly character to have around. So there are some very like, good moments of humour scattered alongside the kind of action and chase and betrayals of the spy drama. This does sound quite silly, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, and everything's done because it's set, obviously, in the early 90s. It's got this, like, very, like, 90s, like, bright colour scheme and everyone's got slightly ridiculous 90s era clothing. They must have generated, like, huge numbers of brightly coloured tracksuits and stuff for the cast to wear and all those kind of Euro club fashion from from the 90s. So, yeah, which now just kind of looks quite over the top. It's got a it's got a very specific tone it's aiming for. It's not like a full on spoof or even like something that's like a sillyus Deadpool and Wolverine, you know, that we discussed last week. But it does is something that's very much got humour in it. I don't know, maybe a bit like the Roger Moore Bond films, but I don't know, maybe but less of the kind of like sex jokes and more of the kind of that guy's mad jokes. He thinks he's from another planet. I mean, a lot of that stuff is dated quite badly, so it's probably a better bet, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess that sort of sense of like humour plus spying, but yeah, I guess updated with the 21st century sensibilities, despite the fact it's set. this is set in like 1990. Okay, so how's this for The Curse of Netflix then? Does this feel like a cut-up movie? It does actually feel more like a TV show, actually, that they seem to have got enough plot. I think it's partly because they've got quite a large cast of characters. You do certainly get, as well as a lot of Cleo, yeah, then this her sort of hapless... West German sidekick Sven you kind of get his full life including like his friends and his his girlfriend and like yeah his superiors and things like that and then there's the conspiracy side as well so it does seem like there's like a lot of plot there's a whole thing involving like a hardline Russian uh, KGB faction in the second season I'm enjoying it I'm not sure if this has the potential to run for years and years and years there's definitely enough material for this second season because they left quite a few mysteries unresolved from the first season i just don't want it to get to a situation that i felt like say orphan black ended up in where it just seemed to be the same conspiracy over and over but in slightly different forms and i think this has a danger in running into this if uh it runs on to sort of four or five seasons i mean maybe they'll come up with something clever you know cleo goes on a world tour they could have they could relocate all the drama to america or something like that or i don't know yeah the far east um, but it, I feel if they're just going to keep it set in in Berlin, there's possibly not a huge amount of more runway for this to run over. But there's certainly any, enough content for two good seasons. I don't know. Netflix does not tend to love the massively long runs. I would assume that unless this is bringing in Stranger Things level money, 
they'll probably either get cancelled or be asked to quietly wrap it up around season three or four. Yeah, that sounds quite likely. Which, yeah, to be fair, three or so seasons of this, I think, would be very good. The problem with any conspiracy thriller is that you have to reveal what the conspiracy is, or else you're just, you know, kind of teasing people and not revealing them. But then where do you go after that? You can either have increasing layers of complex conspiracy, which leads you to believe you don't know where it's going and just string it out indefinitely, or you've kind of taken all the mystery out of the show. Obviously, some things like X-Files managed to run and run and run, but they did a lot more case of the week where we're strongly in arc plot, one big mystery for a season territory here. Okay, well, I'm glad it's working so far. It does sound like fun. It is another one on the I should watch that one day list. Yeah, I'd recommend it. Considering there's so much high profile stuff going on right now between, yeah, Star Wars show, The Boys, things like that, you know, big shows. I just want to give this a shout as something that's maybe flown under the radar a bit, but is good and is definitely worth watching. Full marks for Cleo. Okay, and first up today, it's Alien Romulus, the next, the, I believe, seventh in the Alien franchise, or ninth if you count the two versus Predator ones, and they're going back to basics. It's another group of disposable randoms trapped on a spaceship with an alien. They're there to try and steal some equipment from a seemingly abandoned ship, but inevitably it turns out there's been an alien disaster, and soon this group of people from a, a nearby mining colony, accompanied by Andy, an android who's the sort of surrogate brother of the main character Vane, yeah, find themselves in repeated danger and on the wrong side of some sort of corporate conspiracy as well. It's all a bit of a disaster for them, really. So yes, of course, the alien films have had a bit of a rough couple of decades, but can they finally put it back with this new one? Alistair, if you're somewhat of a fan how they do. Yeah, so I know Alien could be my favourite film of all time. It's certainly up there. And yeah, I guess I would say I think this is the best Alien film since Alien 3, certainly. It's not particularly a high bar to clear. There's been a lot of rubbish ones. But as the fan of the franchise, it's certainly good to have something that's better than, you know, the kind of the last few instalments. Because this is genuinely entertaining it's quite creepy it's got some quite scary moments a few good jump scares you know yeah properly made me flinch in the cinema they got rid of all the tedious mythology building that the previous two films had to tell a story that's much simpler and stronger of yeah the classic alien premise of as you said some unfortunate people stumble across something really nasty and unpleasant in space yeah, I just enjoyed this as I was watching it, and I was also enjoying, as I was watching it, that I wasn't watching an alien film with a vague feeling in the back of my head that, this is a bit rubbish, isn't it? I was just <laughs> lost in the drama. So as a fan of the franchise, I appreciated all that. Yeah, as a less committed fan of the franchise, I've seen, I think, two alien films. The first one and the previous one, Alien and Alien Covenant. So very much running the full spectrum of good to bad there. Yeah, and this is a decent movie in that vein. It is a competent alien sci-fi horror action movie. It's well made, it's well acted, it bops along. It's very much decent rather than transcendent. You know, there's not much happening here to push the boundaries of what cinema or even like the sci-fi horror genre can do. It's some people in a series of tense scenes trying not to get killed by aliens. But I know the alien fans have suffered long and are understandably <laughs> yeah. just happy that someone's finally made a not shit one. Yeah. So, fair enough. Very much the headline here. I, I have my complaints, which mostly can be summarised in by just saying fan wank, basically. There's a few, hey, remember this? References to the old movies, which I, I found slightly annoying, and I say that having not seen most of them. But the basics are here. It's a decent enough sci-fi action movie. If you're hoping to see the genre be invented, then maybe you're not going to find that, but yeah, it's doing what it's doing. It's not trying to do anything more than that. Yeah, it's it's got a lot to say for it, really. I enjoyed the cast. I thought, yeah, yeah, some great people in this. Kaylee Spaney, um, I believe is the main uh, the main actress, Rain. Uh, he said, yeah, um, she's very talented. Relatively unknown, although she got a lot of positive reviews and uh, applause for the film Priscilla about Elvis Presley's wife, Priscilla, which I have seen and she's really, really good in that playing quite a different character here but it's you know it's good that they've chosen someone young to put the at least this installment of the franchise on but having a relatively new face means you're coming with not very many preconceptions about the person and the character which just allows you to really empathize with them also david johnson um who i really enjoyed in rye lane a great british rom-com that you know that made it into my top five films of last year uh again here doing a dramatic role he's he's um he's very good yeah as the android andy who gets reprogrammed you know and suddenly goes from being quite nice and lovable to being much colder and yeah more dangerous not in a sort of murderous way but in a more sort of willing to sacrifice humans some humans to save the others way 
it really taps into that fear of you know familiar things changing becoming unfamiliar and scary you know friends turning against you um those kind of deep psychological fears that um his performance taps into so yeah I mean, they got some, yeah, just some some of the good things that, yeah, you just want from like a film to like fire on all levels. Good music, good visual effects, you know, some good action scenes. So yeah, it's really one for like, you know, just getting the basics right. Yeah, yeah, I do. I agree. Yeah, the story does just move along very. It moves along very steadily. Actually, I was impressed quite how soon after the credits we just got straight into them. You know, stupidly flying into the abandoned ship to get killed. Yeah, basically, there's a couple of brief scenes on the mining colony. And Ben's like, right, we're off on our dubious under-the-radar space mission. Let's hope nothing goes wrong, because we'd be completely on our own. Yeah, get straight to it. Can't complain. Uh, David Johnson is very good, as you say. He's probably the standout here. He gives a very fun sort of back-and-forth performance as this synthetic who goes through these reprogrammings. He's he, he's great in this. The others all do decent work in their sort of parts as various places on the horror victim spectrum. But David Johnson's doing some good stuff here. Yeah, I did like the cast, largely British cast, at least a lot of people doing British accents, things like that. I guess that referenced back to the original Alien with Ian Holm and uh, John Hurt and people like that in it, and Charles Dance in the uh, Alien 3 and all the rest of it. But yeah, there's just a lot of characters. Yeah, again, using usually quite simple, basic characters, but like, you know, they've got each got a little bit of characterization and quite a lot of personality, even if they are just, you know, the angry one who doesn't like androids or the sort of hard-bitten pilot or the the older brother or something. Well, older brother role, but I guess he's he, he's his cousin who's trying to keep them together and keep his family together. Obviously, the main yeah the orphan's main character who wants to escape their horrible mining colony. Yeah, I mean, and just a few short scenes of how awful life is on the mining colony just kind of sets up all the motivation you need. Really, it's just like quite functional. Yeah, and yeah, again, it's not trying to be a deep character study of these characters. It's just trying to you know give them a bit of background and a bit of personality so that you care a bit when inevitably the the space mission goes wrong and the the aliens start flying at them and yeah and then there's some good action sequences making sort of interesting different takes on the sort of the standard alien or sci-fi horror tropes there's a fun bit with alien acid blood towards the end which was quite fun yeah this is the film that's probably made the most of the whole acid for blood thing which, yeah, it's used in the first one and it's used in other uh, Alien films as a plot device. But also, yeah, it really digs into actually the quite simple thing, which I'm surprised hasn't been used more in a franchise, is that if you are in a tin can in space, surrounded by, you know, no air and the harshest environment in the universe, the you know, the full void of outer space. So spilling very, very powerful acid is a terrible idea because it'll burn straight through your hull and, yeah, then you get explosive decompression. So, yeah, and actually, yeah, they um, really make the most of that dramatic point and also, yeah, just the danger of the acid. There's a very cool bit when the gravity on the space station or spaceship turns off and they have to float through the air avoiding the, the clouds of alien acid, which is, yeah, that's probably the best bit of the film, but it's a very, very good scene. So that's the sort of thing that they've been lacking, just really cool, you know, action bit that the films have really been lacking in, in the previous ones with their over-reliance of unpretentious mythology building. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good combination of, yeah, cool action bits and creepy sort of horror bits where it's sort of like, D- don't make a sound or they'll kill us, that sort of thing. They've managed to fit both of those in, which is impressive, and they do both of them fairly well. Yeah, partly because this plot seems to do first the plot of Alien and then Aliens quite quickly together, which I quite like the fact they managed to do both of them in that. You know, I'm dropping, going to drop spoilers fairly liberally here from this point on. So yeah, do run away if you want to see this spoiler free. But yeah, they kind of do a condensed run of the first two films in some ways in that, yeah, they get on the, the weird spaceship, they unleash some facehuggers. Again, this one makes use of the facehuggers more with them. Bits of them swimming and lots of bits of them trying to grab on people's faces. And then, yeah, you have the usual alien bit. Someone gets face hugged. The chest burster bursts out. It runs around. It then grows into a giant alien. And then they have to run through various corridors trying to avoid it. Um, and they basically do a little bit of alien. And then it turns out, actually, there's loads of them on this space station, not just this one. And then you get a whole bit of aliens with rifles and action and things being shot and, um, you know, lots and lots of aliens coming at them. So... Yeah, they managed to do a horror bit and an action bit. So yeah, kind of speed running both the first two films. I've never seen Aliens, so I didn't, didn't get that specific reference, but I was still able to enjoy the film. There's also a lot of quite good sort of grisly body horror, which I know is another Alien staple. You know, stuff growing out of people, people's limbs getting horribly mangled, acid getting spilled on them. But yeah, there's some good grim, gnarly shit. Yeah, yeah, lots of people being impaled on the tail, things like that. I gather from Twitter that they did quite a lot of practical effects for this, especially the aliens themselves. It does help it look uh, really good. Obviously, there's a lot of CGI, especially in the, the outer space bits. But the practical effects, I think, yeah, really make it feel visceral and real, which helps. 
Yeah, although they did also, speaking of CGI, bring back a dead actor to play a reasonably large sort of supporting role. He's probably the closest this film has to a villain, apart from the aliens. Yeah. Like, if we're in the full spoiler section, then yeah, consider yourself prepared for a spoiler. Yeah, they bring back Ian Holm, playing, I think, a slightly different variation on his android from Alien. And, yeah, it's a bit weird looking. Maybe that's meant to be part of the horror, but it's a bit strange, and I don't really know what it adds. Apart from being another weird nod. Yeah, I think it's part of the continuity. I guess if they're doing another instalment in a big franchise, there has to be these continuity things that, yeah, that the fans want, or at least the executives think the fans want, like, you know, continuing continuity, such as, yeah, little bits like there's a bit of them, they find the alien from the Nostromo in the first film, and there's a bit when you see some Nostromo debris, and then that's the alien that spawns these ones in this film. Yeah, they've digitally resurrected Ian Holm. I did look this out on Twitter, so again, this might be wrong, but I believe they did have his family's permission to do that, but it is a little odd how they've, yeah, resurrected him, I guess, using AI and things like that. Yeah, I didn't mind the bit with them finding the Nostromo alien. I could live with a bit of continuity. I just thought the old digital necromancy is a bit weird, especially when it just seems so franchisey and unnecessary. Yeah, exactly. They could have just had anyone doing you know, the evil synthetic in this. You didn't yeah. have to be. They didn't have to make him look like Bishop from the first film. The character's called Rook in this. It's obviously a nod to your Bishop from the first film. Yeah, there's also a bit towards the end where one of the characters says, "Get away from her, you bitch," which is a classic line from a film I have not seen. But even without having seen it, I could tell it was meant to be a, a cheer line from the way it was delivered, and it was a bit silly. Yeah, that was that's unnecessary. That was definitely pure fan service yeah and i kind of wish they hadn't done that the few other nods most of them probably unnecessary this film ends with a voiceover log being recorded completely unnecessary that's a nod to the also completely unnecessary voiceover log at the end of the first alien film one of the few blemishes on that otherwise excellent movie the kind of pointless voiceover log at the end that's not needed to wrap up the plot there's a few bits of the um, in the final sequence again with the the costume, the sort of underwear based costume the main character is wearing is also yeah similar to the one from the first film. The colonial marines are referenced again, and the colonial marine rifles from Aliens are a plot point in this. And yeah, you do get to see them fired. For those of you who remember Aliens, they can't use them because of the uh, the nuclear reactor and have to switch to flamers. So yeah, you have the colonial marines rifle finally get to see those used on the Aliens. I mean, that's not really necessary to understand that's a nod. It's just a gun, really, if you're, you know, if you're unaware. I did also like, actually, that this, that they make a kind of using liquid nitrogen canisters, a cold sort of spray weapon to use on the aliens, which is a nice inversion of the flamers from Alien and Aliens. Um, that this time, yeah, they're trying to freeze it rather than fry it. Those were the largely pointless, largely unnecessary fan service bits, which, again, is, yeah, one of the flaws of the film. They could just make a film about people stumbling over an alien and being killed. That'd be great. I think there's a certain level of continuity I'm willing to not bitch about. It's just when they start really having full-on bits of the story or bits of dialogue happening again just to please the fan base that I find slightly frustrating. But, you know, I'm okay with the films taking place broadly in the same universe. You know, these things happen. But, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, as I say, it's a decent movie. It's it's watchable. It's fun. You know, people are being dissolved and having things blown out of them way. This stuff is not a terminal issue. There's only a few bits of it where it really becomes unavoidably annoying. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the stuff about the colonial marines is a sort of level of in-universe continuity that makes it feel like a whole universe because people would know what, like, yeah, colonial marine is if they were colonists. That makes sense. Yeah, literally repeating lines is going too far. But also in the term, in the world of nods, I did also appreciate a few nods thrown into 2001, which was quite nice. The kind of quite balletic space bits of the docking and undocking with the main ship really reminded me of how 2001 shot. Uh, and also, yeah, the kind of Ligeti's like soundtrack making the aliens seem really weird and the sort of choral vocal bit that sounds very, very odd, really harking back to the monolith's theme from 2001. That sort of stuff works quite well because it's more subtle. Uh, yeah, and again, the music was great in this and there's lots of weird, creepy things making the aliens look proper a aliens. So that sort of stuff was good. Uh, more of that, please. Less of the direct fan service. Yeah, I bet despite all that, you know, they've successfully made a decent, enjoyable film. Maybe they'll manage to do it again, who knows. Uh, there's also a bit at the end, which I don't know if we're going to spoil or not, which brings in maybe a, a shred, a wee little bit of mythology from Prometheus, which I, I, I've not seen that film either. But, you know, there's enough 
exposition in this film for me to understand what was going on. To be honest, if anything, the ending kind of got oversold to me online. I was expecting it to go properly batshit for the way if I was talking about the weird ending. You no, know, go full experimental cinema, but it was just some, some more icky fun horror stuff. I quite liked it, but it was not as completely off the wall as I had maybe hoped. But that's not the film's fault, that's the internet's fault. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if we should spoil with more details. I suppose probably most people are versed to spoilers are left at this point, but yeah, they they make proper use out of that classic horror beat, which all the alien films, at least all the good ones, really use very well. Is you think the monster's dead? Oh wait, there's one more one more round of horror to come. So yeah, they make really good use of that beat with something quite unpleasant and nasty happening right at the very end. For the record, I liked it. I thought it was a good horror escalation. I watched Mark Cabot's review and he was very much like, oh, it was going well. It was actually quite a good alien film. And then at the very end, they brought all that Prometheus stuff and I just hated it. It's like just some more sci-fi horror, man. It doesn't, I mean, maybe you were just really traumatised by Prometheus and any slight reminder is enough to tip you over the edge. But I don't know. It didn't seem like that big a wank off to me. And I've just spent about 10 minutes complaining about wank off. So I know what I speak of. Yeah, I mean, you don't really need to know much about Prometheus. They just mention, like, Prometheus as in stealing the fire from the gods in that they're trying to steal the power of the aliens, their biology to use as a weapon. I mean, and like, the notion of stealing fire from the gods comes up in all sorts of sci-fi, especially. I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure I read a book this week that's they used the same metaphor. In fact, yeah, I did. It was in Haim Namunrari, I can never say that right, novel in which a character likens himself to Prometheus in the same way. It's a reoccurring theme. I think Mark Cumo might be overacting a bit there, although I really didn't like Prometheus as a film. Maybe the solution to this is that Ridley Scott should no longer be allowed to be in charge of alien films, although I think he did produce this and probably had some say in it anyway. Um, but yeah, they brought on the director from the new Evil Dead film. And yeah, so at least good horror director delivers good horror movie in sort of shocker. Yeah, that's what he's done. As I say, I can pick out a few bits which maybe didn't work, but all in, it's a decent movie. It's not going to change your life, but congratulations, Alien fans. They've birthed an okay one. Yeah, it's certainly not troubling Alien or Aliens for the coveted top positions in the franchise, you know, which fans prefer either one or the other. To be honest, probably not really troubling Alien 3 for the third place spot, although there are some things in this film that are kind of up there with this level. But yeah, hands down, best thing they've done in 30 years and uh, a genuinely good film. So as a fan, I appreciate that. Now roll on this TV show from the creator of Legion, which I really hope is going to be good. Yeah, yeah, I'm up for that. <laughs> Lastly today, it's I Saw the TV Glow, a creepy horror drama film which was released in America earlier this year and is now screening in indie cinemas in the UK where we recently saw it. This is about... Owen, an isolated teenager, increasingly uncomfortable in his own skin, who becomes preoccupied with The Pink Opaque, a charmed slash Buffy-esque fantasy drama from the late 90s, early 2000s, about two teenagers who live miles away from each other, but fight demons using their shared telepathic powers. And as time goes by, Owen meets a young woman who lives nearby, who also has a preoccupation with this show, and together they realise that their obsession with this show might be becoming something a bit weird. And yeah, I'm probably going to try not to spoil this one, I reckon, as it seems a shame to have this spoiled by us on a podcast, as it's a very good, very affecting film with a lot of very interesting, strange plot twists. But that is the gist. Alistair, what did you think of it? Yeah, this is great. I'm sure this is going to be one of those reviews where you just like heat praise on it. Um, I thought this was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, it's beautiful, it's weird, it's dark, it's engrossing. You have no idea where it's going. You know, it always takes unusual twists and turns. It's kind of got some surprising things. It's one of those quiet art films where the plot moves slowly and there's a lot of space for emotional and character development. You were saying about Alien Romulus, that that's not a deep character study. It's like functional, you know, horror action film, whereas this really has scope for like very detailed characterization to make the characters feel like real people, you know, and it builds to real devastating sort of finale. So, yeah, I can't really uh, praise this enough or recommend it strongly enough. Yeah, no, I thought this was excellent. I'm obviously, I grew up as a teenager watching Buffy-esque fantasy dramas. I guess we have reached a point where people my age are making films about the experience of being a teenager my age. Allegorically speaking, this is, without going any further and spoiling it, kind of a trans allegory. I think the writer-director, Jane Schoenbrunn, has been very clear about that. There's a lot in there just about the experience of being uncomfortable in your own skin and... Yeah, even for those of us who are cisgender, about the experience of being trans and being uncomfortable in your own gender. There's, yeah, there's a lot about being uncomfortable in general. It's a very uncomfortable film. (laughs) 
and it yeah, get, I, gets more and more so as it goes along. Yeah, I think it's a great portrait of being a sort of isolated, lonely teenager. Again, probably the specifics of this character relate to, yeah, well, these characters to being queer and being trans in a small town that may not understand them, things like that. Again, don't want to spoil too much. But, I mean, the way great drama works, things like that, is you need your drama to be specific enough to individual characters so they feel like real people going through something real, but also have something that's general and universal that everyone can relate to, almost everyone can relate to. And I think lots of people watching this, like myself, can relate to the idea of being a, a lonely isolated and awkward teenager not necessarily for the same reasons or maybe not quite so isolated and, and awkward as some of these characters but I still think it's a great portrayal of like how hard it is to be a teenager and how lonely and like depressing it can be and it kind of comes through in everything in the film it's not just the plot say or the dialogue it's kind of conveyed in the mood and the atmosphere and the music and the visuals and the sort of slightly strange sequences that are the classic are these happening are these metaphor are they in the character's imagination so it's kind of deploying everything in the filmmaker's toolbox to create this mood and this this sensation that these characters are going through yeah no it's definitely a very heavy mood piece there's a lot of like just lot of long slow quiet conversations and yeah as you say sequences which are probably some level of metaphor about the exact way the character is feeling it's very very focused on getting you inside the character's head which becomes pretty pivotal as yes a lot of the action of the film is about this character's identity literally unraveling yeah, yeah. But there's a lot of yeah, things in the lines of alienation, self hatred, which yeah, can be a problem I think for trans people, yeah, especially in small towns who don't un- understand themselves or don't have a support network or things like around them or, you know, a place in the world. But I think a lot of people can relate to alienation, self hatred or being you know, abuse yeah, there's obviously a plot line of the characters being abused by their relatives. Again, don't want to say too much, but it really is, yeah, very emotionally visceral. Yeah, the two main actors, uh, Justice Smith as the lead character and Bridget Lundy-Payne as the girl who befriends him, are both excellent. They're both very intense in slightly different ways, in sort of recognisably teenage ways as well. There's The main, main, main character, Owen, is a bit sort of quiet and his friend Maddie, played by Bridget Lundy-Payne, is a, a bit of a sort of try-hard teenage cool girl, I guess. Instead of just being quiet and sad, she's sort of masking her pain by sort of trying to appear like cool and familiar with it. And then eventually it all just obviously sort of unravels, especially for Owen. And yeah, I, again, it's, it's hard to really talk about it in detail. But yes, the moments where the twists and stuff come together with the characterization about two thirds through or something is pretty harrowing. And it's another horror film, kind of like Alien Romulus, but because it's about feeling your identity kind of unravel in a way that is a bit less familiar than just, oh no, he's been impaled or even, oh no, he's got something growing out of him. It's very creepy. It's very intense. It's very, I don't know. Possibly not a film to watch if you're feeling, you know, sad and down and, and not in the mood for pushing the limits of identity. Yeah, yeah, it definitely horror, but in a sort of kind of weird, slightly creepy way. Like, it's not that scary. Not, I mean, it's not even as scary as, say, Alien Romulus, which had, like, some jump scares and some quite viscerally unpleasant bits of violence in it. But it's it's just it creates this mood, and the mood is kind of horror kind of ups- upsetting kind of unsettling you know it kind of mood that gets under your skin and leaves an emotional impression but it's not something that will make you want to hide behind a sofa or something like that it's got a really strong kind of aesthetic to the whole thing which is kind of a bit retro a bit odd you know it's kind of got these weird visuals quite sort of staid performances again as i said before it's quite quiet and slow there's lots of nods to 90s tv things and kind of like the way they use like makeup and lighting and color and production design that kind of makes it feel kind of old-fashioned but it's sort of in a sort of weird way um the sort of uncanny nature of the past again it's just it's very much a mood piece that creates a specific mood i mean if you get the opportunity to see this in the cinema really do because you know you want to be like in a sort of dark quiet environment not interrupted um you know where you can really get lost in the feeling of this film yeah it's definitely a good one to immerse yourself in because it's definitely trying to create a really strong feeling like the dread is a lot less like obvious and a lot more kind of existential and yeah the references to some of the specifics of like old 90s fantasy shows and like i I think i had one of the episode guidebooks they talk about at length in one sequence there's quite a lot of clips from the show which remind you a little bit of various things amber benson who played tara in buffy pops up in a, a one scene cameo just to make sure we're clear what's being referenced 
Yeah, there's also um, it feels a bit Power Rangers at moments. Although, yeah, it's it's not really aiming for that tone at all. But the kind of the the show within within the film, the the pink opaque with the kind of sort of weird monster of the week with a kind of slightly strange costume and things like that. It's kind of got the sort of slightly Power Rangers vibe as well to it, I felt as well. Obviously, probably Buffy is the biggest thing, as you mentioned. But there's lots of lovely 90s nods, you know, for like cassettes and CRT TVs and the whole thing of you have to watch something live. There's no streaming or DVDs you can get hold of on the internet or at best you can tape something and share a VHS. That kind of the scarcity and the event nature of TV that sort of created... You know, that's kind of captured very, very well, which was a big part for, you know, people, you know, the both of us and probably a lot of people listening to this podcast who were, yeah, young in the 90s, but, you know, like old enough to have tastes and interests and watch TV and things like that. And we remember this stuff quite fondly. So it's it's kind of riffing on those. I think I'm sure the creator of the film did it probably is from this generation as well. So, yeah, it taps into that 90s nostalgia, but not in a cheesy sort of like, way. it's the 90s sort of way, more in a kind of more sort of, I don't know, with a sort of loving dedication that period dramas recreate the Victorian era or the Regency or ancient Rome or something like that with, you know, proper attention to detail and creating mood and something that feels authentically of the time. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of these bits of culture we liked when we were that age, like uh, Buffy is an obvious one, Harry Potter might be another one, have gone on to become quite formative parts of the, the millennial identity, I guess. So there's possibly something being said in this film alongside its many other messages about you know getting too much of your identity from pop culture in that way i guess because millennials are both major consumers of pop culture because we have disposable income and go to the cinema and things like that and also you know what's the point when we're influential in terms of making pop culture because millennials some of them in their like 40s and things like that have risen through the ranks of studios and have become directors commissioning executives people who sign up in films and especially you know millennials have a lot of them reached the stage where now they have art house tastes moved on from the kind of the beating heart of pop culture that you know radio one culture to to be more interested in things like you know independent cinemas so a film that is an independent film an offbeat art house unusual film that riffs on 90s nostalgia is kind of very much in a lot of millennials ballparks so i can see why this has been successful because it does tap into a wider range of ongoing 90s nostalgia so does cleo as well which we talked about obviously before but yeah again probably alien to a degree and they made alien movies in the 90s and stuff things like that star wars obviously yep yeah, plenty of star wars films in the 90s and star wars is a big shaper of the millennial identity and contemporary culture in that regard you can see it in other things there's so many bands consciously written riffing on 90s music and culture so it's having a moment yeah you know and this is tapping into that which i feel is why it's connected with people online and it's got a bigger audience outside the film festival sort of crowd and you know especially with the specific reference to things like Buffy as you say and things like that that people are very into and clearly having something to say about gender trans queer teen issues as well that all helps so it's all leading to this becoming as I said at the top like a bit of a cult film of the moment and things like that but it is really great and does like kind of use that 90sness to kind of again to add to the very precise mood it's making I don't think this film would work. Uh, there's the plots that we talked about, but I don't think the mood would have worked set present day. It would have had to gone for a different mood. But the 90s mood works very well. Yeah, no, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm sure there will be films made like this about the, the hellish experience of going up nowadays with the internet, chattering and gobbling at the corner of every second of your life. But yeah, this is a very specific kind of loneliness, which very much does come from growing up in a pre-internet world. Yeah, you mean, you think that like in the days of Tumblr, and Twitter and you know TikTok now... Those teens could, through their smartphones, connect with people who, the people who are feeling what they're feeling, or connect with people who've been to what they're doing, or find some sense of wider community, which is what they're missing because they're just you know born too young. Yeah, or they could have their sort of mental health frailties absolutely exploited by algorithms that are going to make them feel terrible and pump harmful content down their throats. So, I don't know. Maybe the nineties were better in some ways. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, if a lot of the opening chunk of this film is about the thrill of, you know, finding somebody else who likes the thing you like, which is obviously not a problem nowadays. Well, unless you actually value finding them in real life. Yeah, exactly. There's a really great sort of, I don't know, just the way it's done is just so artfully, you know, with everything thought out, wanting like every kind of, I mean, a lot of films, are, you know, like big productions in Marvel films, things like Alien, obviously everything's thought out, everything's planned, scripted, storyboarded, set dress, but there's just something about the kind of consistency, the kind of the real sense of mood that's created through the whole thing that really makes this film beautiful. It reminded me a lot of slightly weird sort of kind of 
visually experimental and kind of you know films that kind of rely a lot on conveying an emotion through a tone and visuals rather than essay being heavy on plots and great films uh, Moonlight that obviously did well at the Oscars a few years ago it's kind of in a similar vein with that I suppose that film's got another LGBTQ plot element to it as well but that's you know similar thing Upstream Colour a uh, sort of sci-fi film again that has a similar sort of vague the neon demon that we discussed that's more of a straight up horror movie but it does have a very precise mood and feeling to it um that one boils over into actual kind of body horror at the end which this doesn't but it does have that kind of consistent creepy unsettling mood and also to be honest a bit not a film but the podcast welcome to night vale has also that kind of things on as they seen weird stuff going on in kind of the small town vibe to it bit twin peaks i suppose in that regards as well so yeah, yeah there's, it's a bit lynchian yeah I, I i always feel a bit weird comparing things to david lynch because he's a very singular voice but there is something of the david lynch to it yeah i mean we watched blue velvet for the podcast and again that's more of a straight up horror violent creepy film but you know with the weird stuff going on in suburbia the strange characters the sort of reality seen through this kind of weird distorted prison there's a lot of lynchian stuff going on here which again Lynch's influence, Night Vale, there's a Night Vale-iness to this. Night, Night Vale, I can see the sort of everyday, I don't know, Night Vale. The thing with Night Vale is it feels very safe and cuddly. Like, there's a sort of casual reference to bad things happening, but it never feels, I don't know, on the edge of despair in the same way that this film does a lot of the time. Like, I can fully imagine people comfort listening to large amounts of Night Vale because there's something kind of nice about it. Mm. This film is not overly nice. I would. I mean, there may well be people who find this to be a comfort watch. I don't know. I but I think it's quite a difficult film. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, I guess it's more fun in terms of like the mood that's created. That kind of strange things quite as they seem normally. I mean, of those films I mentioned, probably the closest to this is Moonlight, which has again, it's a difficult film. It's emotional. Like this film, it offers up a lot of emotional things. Doesn't necessarily offer clear answers or a, a happy way out, which is what yeah, like you say. Nothing that bad ever happens in Night Vale. In fact, the people are quite happy in their <laughs> horror town. But yeah, a film that, you know, uses kind of a sense of weirdness, visuals, music, um, the sense of, you know, what you're seeing is not necessarily what's happening or, you know, Moonlight is very much like that. It, in that sense, it reminds me more of sort of works of abstract art, you know, things like from the Impressionists through to paintings of Francis Bacon or people like that, um, Picasso, you know, so you name it. When you're clearly not looking at reality, you're looking at a warped version of reality to convey a strong feeling and emotion and tone and kind of, even though you're looking at a warped version of reality, not reality itself, that makes you more, it makes it more real and makes you more in the head of the characters and more in tune with them than it was if you, if they adopted a much more Mike Lee kitchen sink style approach, um, which is one of the great strengths of this film. Yes, although another great strength for this film, I will say, because we, we may have just made it sound like it's just a long series of, I don't know, tonal images with angry music over it or something, is there is actually a plot, there is actually a story. It's not the most involved plotty story in the world, as Alastair said earlier, but there is, you do eventually realise what, what is going on and what is happening and the full horror of it, and that it is quite beautifully set up and quite interesting and quite a good twist and yeah it's, it's actually done very very well despite the fact that as i say this is not the most plot heavy film the plot that is there is very well done yeah yeah exactly yeah and there's some good twists and yeah there's some surprises as well as i said like it's one of those things you're not quite sure where it's going or what it's going to lead to and even when the ending came i was a bit like is this the ending is it not sure is more going to happen this is a point where it could end but also not yeah i mean it's not a film that gives you easy answers or even a a clear definitive ending really no 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 it's easy to feel uncomfortable as is its once <laughs> I, I did find a couple of reviews who reviewers i guess who absolutely hated it who really just found it the, the long quiet scenes and agonizing conversations just completely unbearable which I, I can kind of understand i guess but i really liked it watch the film and then decide what that says about me i mean that kind of long agonizing quiet scenes and stuff is very much what it's aiming at but I can see why people think this film's pretentious. I like pretentious things. Uh, maybe I am pretentious myself, but I like this film. Uh, and I thought it was it was great and really powerful. And, you know, I've been recommending it to people this week to go see it. Yeah, and I'm recommending it to you guys now. Yeah, definitely going to probably be in the top films of the year unless it's a stunner back half of the year. Yeah, no, I thought this was fantastic. Uh, yeah, fellow British people, if this is still on at your local indie cinema, then consider going and seeing it. I'm not going to say it's a good time, but it's it's a very, very emotional, thoughtful time. 
I mean, it's one of those films that's just the magic of cinema. It's powerful. It's brilliant. You have a collective experience. Maybe not a positive one, but it's a powerful <laughs> collective experience. That's the, the magic of cinema. That's the, the power of the medium. That's all we have time for in this episode. If you have enjoyed this episode of Moderate Fantasy Violence, then please subscribe in your podcatcher of choice. While you're there, please leave us a review to help other people find out about the show. You can also visit our website, moderatefantasyviolence.com, where you can find back issues of the podcast, bonus audio clips, and short written pieces by Nick and myself. And please also follow us on social media, where you can find us at Moderate Fantasy Violence on Facebook, MFE Podcast on Twitter and Blue Sky, and maybe some other networks, I forgot. And you can also find me on most of those networks and many more besides. The search Nick Bryan, that's Bryan with a Y and a little red cartoon avatar should pop up. Or you can go to my website and find out directly about my exciting self-published comics. And thank you very much. You can find more from me by searching for Alistair Ball on Twitter, Blue Sky or Instagram. Or you can get more of my writing at redtrainblog.com. Or you can find my theatre reviews at everythingtheatre.com. Or you can join us here next time when we will be moving to a small town and getting involved in some weird cult stuff in Cuckoo, <laughs> and then trying travelling back to our original timeline with some differences in the final season of Umbrella Academy. Join us in two weeks to discover what we made of those. Until then, goodbye. Bye. for the out <laughs> <laughs> yeah I thought I'd just let that sit there I didn't feel like me saying yep really added much <laughs>